we should start the session. I should still just be rambling. Oh, are we live? Hey. Well, it's oh, connected. Maybe take, we're, but, are we live or maybe we're connecting? It's okay. Anybody who has meetings with me knows that I'm always a little bit late. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Hey. Welcome to day two <laughs> of our lightning talks. <laughs> we will continue to have polls. And hopefully this time it will be slightly smoother than than yesterday. We're considering boxcar as an option to make this go quicker. Mm, yes. Mm. And now I need to find everybody to pull them up. So we tagged some folks in um, Slack. Uh, uh, and so let's get our first folks up here. And we have some ground, we have a ground recommendation for all speakers um, coming forward. So we're going to make jokes between talks, but after the other person before you finishes, please, um, like, if you're on deck, then um, try to start getting yours airing and sharing while we're making jokes. Or making great, very insightful, deep commentary. I think that's really what's happening, right? Yeah. The bonus part of joke, uh, of getting your thing up faster so you don't have to listen to our characters. That's true. So like, if you really want to feel the pain of bad puns for a long time, pretend you have computer errors. <laughs> it, it, because like, otherwise it's just pun-ishment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you mean it sounds punny. I am just into it. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, all right, so we have our first lightning talk from Angela and Jay and John. And uh, who's on deck? And Celia's on deck. Yeah. And I still keep forgetting to turn off my Slack sounds. Do, do, do. <laughs> Am I pinned? I don't want to be pinned on stage. This is terrible. Yes, we we will. I think you should be pinned on stage. I think it's just part of who you are now. Uh, yeah. Oh. Oh. Right. It's. Um. I did want to say yesterday I felt so shamed for not having animal clothing, but I still today do not have animal clothing. However, I do have rainbow clothing, and I'm wearing this to represent all of the spectroscopists in the audience. Mm, wow. Wow. Oh, wow. Round of applause for a lot of spectroscopists. Yeah. yeah apparently, right. do we need a spectroscopy plot? Uh, or do we need like a spectrum <laughs> of uh, <laughs> sweet talks? <laughs> I, I want everyone to be able to absorb the information. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> okay. I need to stop. Um, <laughs> do um, y'all have your. You're, are you able to present? Oh. Oh no, we can't hear you, Angela. Oh, I see the astronomers piping up in the chat. I feel seen, even though I'm a recovering astronomer. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I want to say, you know, there's lots of us, lots of other domains can have spectroscopy. It's, it's uh, true. You know. Yeah. <laughs> if I sign out of work chat, that, that's how those sounds go away, right? <laughs> okay, so An Angela's back. Can, can you unmute, Angela? Are we able to hear you now? Uh... No. Okay. Well, Angela, why don't you, um, if you're going to come, maybe we could put Celia next. Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, you might need to restart your browser instance. Yeah. So we'll let you go next, but Celia can present now. Yeah. We're blue shifting Celia a little bit. and Surprise, voice. Celia. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. We hear you. Awesome. Nice to see you again. Long time. Should I start? Yes, start. Do it. I'm counting down now. So you only have five. Awesome. Will do. 
Uh, so hello everyone, my name is Celia and we, when we are the co-chairs of the diversity and inclusion at SciPy this year. As in every year, we like to share some diversity numbers from the conference. Uh, we know that diversity has many angles. So in this great presentation, we only cover three aspects of the diversity spectrum, and those are gender identity, age, and ethnicity. So the source of our data is the survey that contains diversity questions that are optional during the registration. And across the years, usually 80% of the participants uh, complete them. So in our gender identity, we expanded this year uh, to have a little bit more information on the questionnaire. Again, our non-binary attendance is low and we need to work more closely with the LGBTQ plus and the transgender communities to see how can we make SciPy more welcoming to them. This year we had the amazing honor of having Tess Tenenbaum sharing with us the issues that transgender scholars face to help us raise awareness in the SciPy community uh, so we can work towards a more trans inclusive space. So regarding age groups, we can see that each year we are still retaining a more diverse range of ages. Particularly, we are increasing our participation of people between 51 and 65 plus years old and um, younger attendees under 20, 21. Regarding ethnicity, uh, we still have a large percentage of participants that are Caucasian. Almost 40% of the participants for this year and uh, similar to uh, last year. Uh, currently, we only have 3% of participants from Black African American, 5% of Latinos. Uh, but this year, we dedicated 50% of our scholarship budget to support the attendance of Black, Indigenous, and people of color to SciPy. We also actively seek for diverse speakers, but definitely we still have a lot to improve in how we do outreach in these communities. So this year, uh, along with the both co-chairs, uh, we developed two diversity box. We have the diversity success stories in open source that will be happening after uh, the lighting talks. It's gonna be moderated by Carol. Um, we have some amazing panelists like Sara and Ralph and Marlene. And tomorrow we have the Git 101 and how to sprint that is gonna be moderated by Tanya and with panelists uh, Juan and Jacob. So thanks to when Tanya and the sprint co-chairs, uh, this year we have enhanced the sprint sessions with a mentored modality. So this is an effort to tackle some diversity and inclusion issues in the open source community. We will have focused time slots for mentored sprints on Saturday, uh, but please check out the how to sprint both tomorrow. If you have any suggestions on how can we improve the diversity at the conference, or if you wanna be a volunteer next year, please reach out to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Celia. That's so good. Yeah. Thank I, you so I, much I, to the diversity committee for all the work that you've done this year. I think uh, you know this conference is getting better and better every year, and we really appreciate it. Yeah, the diversity committee does like a whole lot of work behind the scenes. In some ways, they have to be the shadow committee, like and touch like all the different parts. Um, and so this year, I think um, watching the stellar evolution of how sprints are handled has been like really exciting. Thank you. Um, cool. Angela, do you have sound? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. That's yes. exciting. <laughs> Hooray. Awesome. Um, awesome. So if y'all want to get set up, I'm inviting the next set of speakers who are Andre, Marissa, and Harshit. And then we have a very important question asked in the poll that I encourage all of you to vote on, um, because, you know, some of us need recipes, so, and I don't want to be too cheesy. 
Okay, take it away, Angela. Okay, thank you so much. All right, uh, hello everyone. I'm John, this is uh, Angela and Jay. We are students of Cal Poly Slo, uh, and we are working for uh, Project Jupiter Cal Poly, and we're making software over the summer. Um, and we are working on an, a Jupyter extension called uh, Jupyter Bifrost. It's a notebook widget that dynamically bridges interactive visualizations and pandas data frames. Uh, the idea is it joins coding and interactive uh, and interacting directly with the graph uh, to make a more rapid, intuitive way to explore data. So just a brief overview of the current state of visualization in Python. Uh, the Jupyter community relies heavily on visualizations to summarize and understand data. Uh, you have your static visualization libraries like Matplotlib and Seaborn that provide a really good, useful standard. And then on top of that, you have libraries like Plotly and Altair that build on top of this and uh, create interactive visualizations where data scientists can actually hover over particular points, hone in on data, and do minor filterings. Uh, this allows data scientists to like really understand and interact with their data live in an intuitive way. But despite all of uh, all the good that this brings, there are some areas of improvement that we could uh, tackle. Uh, one of them is iterative coding can be slow um, to both write and sometimes to run. Uh, and this can be seen in static visualizations where um, sometimes running a cell could take a while to actually update a graph. And uh, this can lead to a lot of overhead. And it kind of bogs down uh, the, the um, intention of the user, uh, which is data exploration. They have to think about what they're actually querying instead of exploring the, um, the terrain, essentially. Um, it could also, iterative coding can become cluttered. Uh, you have to remember the order of operations of your cells, and sometimes the, the notebook can kind of get disorganized. Um, and even with interactive GUIs, it's hard to bring your uh, edits back into Python. You could make a bunch of amazing uh, explorative uh, edits, but then when you want to create a data pipeline out of it, it's difficult to bring that back into a pandas data frame. And so this was our inspiration to start exploring. And uh, we did some, some research based on these ideas. Yeah, to kind of resolve those problems, we started looking for tools that uh, do a really good job of letting um, users very easily and intuitively explore data. One of the ones we looked at uh, is an extension called B2, which incorporates an interactive uh, dashboard um, to let users um, explore uh, data through uh, a user interface um, that is still integrated into a Jupyter Notebook. Um, it also keeps track of all of the user interactions uh, in the GUI, um, in the notebook itself to make it easily reproducible. I think, um, I think Jay's uh, Wi-Fi just went down, so uh, I can take this section. Um, so uh, for our solution, we're developing um, Jupyter Bifrost, which uh, is an extension that's really smoothly integrated um, into Jupyter itself because it's built off of uh, a Jupyter widget. Um, its uh, graphic user interface um, allows users to really easily explore the data, um, apply filters, change encodings um, without recoding a graph every time. So kind of uh, interceding that iterative um, co coding process uh, that um, uh, users were previously relying on. Um, oh, in addition to that, uh, it also keeps track of um, interactions through the history tab. Um, so uh, now interactions with the user interface are um, completely reproducible um, and can be exported uh, back into pandas code um, and pasted back into the notebook um, to make them easily shareable. Uh, and we would love your feedback. Um, so you can scan this QR code uh, to fill out a Google form. Um, uh, to give us a little bit of feedback on our project so far or check out our GitHub. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. And you ended right at four minutes and 30 seconds, right? When I was gonna harass you. So <laughs> totally in, great. Um, so I have a great poll that I feel like a lot of people are gonna have strong opinions on. Um, and I'd really like to ask Julie directly. Um, Julie, is oxygen a metal? But it's not even a question. Obviously, it's metal. 
Do you do you breathe in metals? I don't even know. Yes. Yeah. Of course <laughs> you do. Are you alive? You, you need it to start fire, so it's obviously metal. <laughs> like heavy metal. Oh, nice. But see, to me, heavy metal is more like, you know, the super heavy metals, like uranium. Yeah, or, or like hydrogen or helium. Oh, <laughs> whoa, are you just adding chaos to that? <laughs> I know, Bridget has said that backstage, and she she would actually know. So I'm just, I'm just stealing her jokes, but. Wow, it seems I like the 50% of people who are saying no. <laughs> <laughs> Did, are, are we going to reveal the answer or is this in another poll? Um, well, there is another poll coming that has another question. So we're just going to leave this and everybody gets to wonder during this lightning talk everything about it. Who's up next? We have that would, that would be Andrew, who I see is queued up. And has some other. OK, so uh, we're ready to go. Marisa, would you like to share the screen? OK, hello, everyone. Welcome to our Jupyter Lab extensions talk. Uh, we would like to tell you what we are working on and uh, it's a notifications API and uh, center extension and also a to-do list extension. Next slide, please. So we're a team of Project Jupyter Summer in terms and please note it's our first time contributing to open source and we're really excited about it. My name is Andre and I'm a software engineering senior at Cal Poly. Uh, I'm Harshit, and I'm finally a grad student at Cal Poly as well. And I'm Marissa, I'm a graphic design senior at Cal Poly. So let's talk to-do list extension. We're aiming to provide ability for users to create simple file-based to-do lists that support real-time collaboration and are fully integrated with Jupyter Lab. So uh, we're planning to have Jupyter readable file format, uh, task nesting, color coding and tagging, and due dates. There are some features that are still under consideration in terms of uh, we're not sure they should be in scope. So we would love uh, contribu contributors, volunteers for user testing, uh, or even maybe code contributions. So these features are ability to use UI directly or switch to source markdown on the fly. It's a partial completion of items. It's a special persistence of items on completion, like should they move to the down of the list or not? Uh, also assigning items to collaborators, and we haven't decided uh, which file slash markup format should be used to store our to-do in files. Let's look at the prototype. So I just want to give you context. This is a Figma file uh, prototype, and what we're looking at is just a side view or just like an open drawer panel of this to-do list. So here you can open up other to-do lists, just, just give us an example of file name A, here you can customize the list. So we can customize my color, I'm gonna choose orange. You can put in a due date, I'm gonna say August 12th. And here's a time, I'm gonna put 12.30. And then when you click away, you can see on the top, it changed to orange and now there's new a tag that says it's due on the 12th of August, as well as number two to show that there's two incomplete um, tasks. Here, I'm just adding in a subtask. You just click in the cell and type and same here for a main task. As I do this, you can tell if I click away, there's a number one tag. So that shows that there's one incomplete tag. Here, I'm just going to collapse the finished list. Uh, for the notifications extension, we aim to provide a notification API that extension developers can use to send notifications to users who are connected to a collaborative JupyterLab session. Um, the extension will ship with a notification center widget that lives as a side panel in your JupyterLab environment and gathers notifications in one place. Um, we're planning on providing options for ephemeral or persistent notifications depending on the user customizations. Uh, we currently support system notifications and toast notifications. And we're currently working on the state persistence in the notifications API and um, how notifications should persist across sessions. 
and we're also working on the public API, uh, API capabilities and deciding how the APIs would look like to um, extension developers who might want to use our extensions. And as Andre mentioned, we would really appreciate any advice or suggestions that you guys might have or um, any uh, like volunteers for user testing. And now Marissa would give a quick demo of the prototype for the notifications extension. Again, this is an open drawer um, in context of this file. So if I press here. So up here, this is the notification settings. If you look here, all the types of notifications are activated. But say I want to um, not show any types of notifications like this code testing. If I press that and go back to settings, it will be inactivated. If I go back, we're going to open up this block to show the complete block of notify um, extension notifications here. I can dismiss a specific type of notification as well and as well as clearing an earlier block of notifications from today. Um, that is the end of our presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, if you would like to be um, part of our user testing, or if you're just interested in our project in general, please scan the QR code, and we'll also send in a link. If you just want to talk to us in general about this project, all of our contact information is on this corner. And, uh, <laughs> Thank also you. Link as the Google form in chat. Thank you. Two great wow. Jupiter projects. So Good many good, project. yeah, so many great ideas happening. Um, yeah, so now we have a, um, a more uh, refined definition of what a metal is for those of you. It seems like the astronomers are really taking over, so I encourage anybody who knows the true definition of a metal to vote in this poll. Um, yes, sounds great. Who's who's up next? Uh, we have uh, Srirag, Chloe, and Rahul. Can you, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Let's see, let me share my screen real quick. And then next up, um, we're pulling up Kristen. I like these group talks. This is exciting. So many group talks. This is awesome. Yeah. But everybody's ending too early for me to, you know, be mildly threatening as I make noises to warn you on going overtime. So, but don't go overtime. Otherwise, you're going to get pulled. Like the pulled, pulled or pulled? Who knows? That's the thing. Deal with my Minnesotan accent and its ambiguity. How many lakes are in your... <laughs> More than Wisconsin. Are you all able to... Share? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we lost Srirag's camera, or? I can screen share. OK. Uh, yeah, that would be great. OK, let me just. Oh, Srirag left the stage. Uh, oh, no. You... <laughs> lost him. Um, Kristen, do you maybe want to go? And then we can wait for yes. Srirag's internet, yeah. The tubes apparently are very cranky today. The interconnected tubes are not so interconnected. OK, I'm going to assume you can see this. Yes, this okay. looks great. All right, so I want to make sure everybody knows about the Journal for Open Source Software, or JOS. Um, I am Kristen Thing. I'm at Axiom Data Science. And um, note that these slides are not mine. They're Arfin Smith. He's the editor in chief. Um, I'm an associate editor in chief there. So the Journal for Open Source, oh, and all these names up here are the many editors that we've had um, either presently or they're emeritus editors, though the vast majority of these are presently editors because we have a lot of demand for um, our services. So it is bot assisted peer review. Um, and the problem that JOS was started to address is that software generally hasn't been considered a creditable research activity. 
So um, how could we have, thinking about this, how could we better recognize software contribution? Um, we could find some way to fit software into the current, uh, you know, typical academic system um, or evolve beyond one dimensional credit models. Um, so what if we just wrote papers about software? So uh, like say the traditional paper, you know, that's great because it gives us something easy to cite. Uh, we don't need to do any changes, you know, enact any major changes in our in existing infrastructure and um, publishing in existing journals that people are already paying attention to raises the profile of software within that community. Um, but uh, writing another traditional paper, academic paper is a ton of work. Many journals don't accept software papers and other issues as well that you can think of. So what if we made it as easy as possible to write and publish a software paper? And that's where JOS is coming from. Um, so it's a developer-friendly journal for research software packages. So it's specifically for research software and it um, specifically involves a review of your software um, on GitHub through GitHub issues. Um, the paper, you do write a small paper, but it's meant to be quite short. So that shouldn't take long to um, prepare. And if you have been developing your software in like terms of modern best practices for packaging and stuff and documentation, um, it should be a straightforward process to um, get it into our system and move forward with review. So the primary purpose of a JOS paper is to enable citation credit to be given to the authors of research software. Okay, so um, JOS started in 2016, and um, you can see that we have an exponential-like um, function for, I think this is um, published papers over time. Um, this graph was made last fall, but um, it's continued and we expect it to continue like this into the future. Okay, so um, like I said, reviews happen through GitHub um, as an issue on our uh, JOS um, repository. Um, there is a JOS bot. Um, the bot does as much as we can automate it to do, and this is continually improving over time as well. Um, the bot interacts with the authors, reviewers, and the editors, compiles papers, checks for anything that can be automated, like the open source, presence of an open source license, missing DOIs, et cetera, sending reminders. Um, okay, yeah, some other details on there. Um, so uh, in addition to seeing that people are submitting their software, so there seems to be a demand for this, we've also had good feedback that people enjoy the process from all the different sides. Um, here's a tweet saying that they're impressed by um, the process and a good model for how other journals got to operate. Um, it was intense and interactive review. There's a lot of back and forth in the review process meant to improve the um, software, um, though only very rarely is it like people, it's a very positive process. I've only had um, good experiences myself. Um, transparent, clear, supportive, and inspirational. Okay, and uh, restoring faith in the scientific process. Um, so generally people are really positive about it. I think people that are here are really good people to, um, be thinking about submitting to JOS and um, potentially being a reviewer for JOS. And if you're interested in being an editor, you could um, you know, get in touch as well. We're always getting new editors. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Um, Julie asks a very important question for everybody. Speaking of editors. Of JOS. <laughs> there's, there's so much love for Joss in the chat right now. There's so much love for Joss, but sorry we didn't add any of the Joss editors, except <laughs> the, the meta editor. <laughs> all, all of the above could also mean everybody in that first slide. Right. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, perfect. Exactly. <laughs> so um, who is next? 
So we have, um, I think we're gonna try again, um, and then Chloe is gonna do the pres like the screen share. Yes. Um, here, wait. Sorry, the screen share is slightly different from uh, Zoom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Did you find it? There's yeah. like, okay, perfect. Okay, screen share. Uh, we're gonna bring Matt Craig up next. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Okay. Perfect. So hello, we're another um, Jupiter Lab group uh, working at Cal Poly, um, and we're doing the commenting uh, extension. Hi, I'm Rahul. I'm a rising sophomore at Cal Poly, and I'm one of the software developers of this team. Hello, uh, my name is Shirav Wapala, and I'm a rising junior at Cal Poly studying computer science, and I'm one of the software developers on the team. We're also missing Cameron right now. He's a rising senior at Cal Poly, and he also is a software developer on our team. And I'm Chloe. I'm the designer for this team, and I am a uh, fourth year studying graphic design, also at Cal Poly. So we're building the Commons extension. Um, Real-time collaboration will be a core part of JupyterLab with the release of JupyterLab 3.1. Um, obviously, communication is vital for effective collaboration, but up until now, you haven't been able to collaborate effectively within JupyterLab. Um, you've had to take your conversations outside into um, channels like Slack or GitHub, and also has left users who don't feel comfortable using things like GitHub out of the loop um, and unable to uh, communicate effectively. Um, the commenting extension we're building will provide live comments on cells, outputs, text selections, data sets, and images, um, along with features like quick replies and search filter. It'll also um, support inline law tech, um, as well as uh, custom tags, which will all work together to allow you to um, effectively and quickly communicate with your teammates. Yeah. Uh so another big reason for why comments is uh, crucial for real-time collaboration to be successful is since we have collaboration in a centralized manner, it's important to have a large number of people with or without the technical skills that to navigate GitHub or other platforms to be able to add in comments. But it's also important to add in review to code without actually messing with the true code base. So here we have the general workflow of a comments thing. As you can see, there are cell level comments and there are also text selection comments, which from what we've learned are quite important. For these text selection comments, as you can see, you can just highlight some text. A red icon will pop up, which will prompt an input dialogue. And that you can enter your own text and whatnot, which will pop up on the side panel. As you can see also for text selection comments, there are these preview texts, which as you can see in the actual selection, it correlates with each other. Importantly, you can also edit comments by clicking on them or when you focus on a comment, which will be indicated by a blue outline, you will see a drop down menu indicated by three ellipses where you can edit comments, you can reply to comments, or you can even delete comments if you need to. You're trying to focus on this intuitive and versatile workflow so it'll be easier to just go from one notebook, do whatever code or markdown stuff you want to do, do your highlights, do your text selections, or even your cell level comments, and then just see them pop up on the right side. And one thing I just forgot to add is that you can see the usernames. Those are based on the awareness of a note of one session based on the notebook. We're using cutting edge, like leading real time collaboration. So it's something we're super excited about. <laughs> Um, I want to add something really quick that I forgot in this, which is just on the left. It's a prototype of um, the one that Rule was talking about is what we currently have working. And on the left is what we hope to envision uh, the design as at the end, um, keeping it clean and minimal um, and to be as unobtrusive and easy to sort through um, as possible. Because we've heard from a lot of users that uh, the Google, <laughs> Google Comments uh, panel is a pain to search through. So that's something we're trying to solve. Um, yeah. And then, 
next steps? Yeah, so finally coming to our next steps, we have a GitHub link for everyone to kind of just go through if you're interested in, maybe try and download it and like work on it locally. Uh, it is still in like an alpha state, so we would love your feedback either by giving us issues or if you want to, if you want to fix something, please go ahead and make a pull request. But we're ready for what's coming next and we're happy to uh, engage with the community here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, everybody's finishing at like exactly four minutes, 30 seconds. So it seems like my mildly threatening intimidation is working. I'm feeling great power, everyone. Thank you. Um, anyway, we have another really important uh, poll um, that I think Julie also added. So, which I saw some people in the chat also making this joke. So I don't know if you're um, reading our minds <laughs> or reading the polls in advance, or, you know, we're um, maybe making some visual basic jokes. I don't see that many people uh, will be something. I plus plus to that. <laughs> Um, Matt is up next as I struggle with the interface. Also, I apologize for the typing noise. Um, work from home meant that I was required by law to get the loudest keyboard possible. So can you guys see my screen and hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you okay. Did you vote in those um, metal polls, by the way, Matt? I know that you have uh, probably a similar view as the wrong people. The wrong people? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I remember in a class once drawing the periodic table, and there was hydrogen, and there was helium, and there were dragons, and the rest of it. I don't know what <laughs> I was trained as a cosmologist. <laughs> Okay, take it away, Matt. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk today about a small widget-related package called IPI Events that um, I actually wrote a few years ago, um, but the first official stable release was was today. Um, I teach physics and astronomy in um, Western Minnesota, and the fact that I'm in Minnesota will, will become important in a moment. Uh, so, so rather than sort of talk you through what, what IPI Events does, let me show you. So there, there is a code cell here I've hidden where I'm doing some uh, widget setup. Details aren't important for right now. Um, so there's been some discussion uh, in the chat and, and earlier today about lakes. Um, and uh, so I pulled a, lake, a map from Google Maps this morning and um, have marked Minnesota and Wisconsin on here and thought that we could count the lakes. Um, so one of those details I didn't show you was a lake counter. You can see as I run this, more and more lakes get added. Um, now, it would be nice if I could just click on the lakes, right? I mean, that's what I wanted to do is try clicking on these things. Um, in the core IPy widgets, the, there is no interaction with browser events like that. So in IPy events, what you do is you create an event, and uh, there's a couple key things I'm doing here. One is giving it a source, which widget I want to listen to events on, and what events I want to watch. So I'm going to watch the uh, watch for mouse down, mouse the beginning of a mouse click. Still no clicking. Um, the next piece here is to um, write a function that. Um, will respond when a click is made. So that function takes as an argument a dictionary um, that's populated with information about the event. So in this case, I'm going to grab the x and y position of the cursor from the event, and um, I'll update these counters. And since us folks from Minnesota were fair people, these counts I'm going to do now are going to count for Wisconsin, even though we're just testing it out. Um, OK, still, still nothing, because I, I need to do one last step. I need to tell uh, my event widget that when an event happens, it should respond to the click. So let's try this. And sure enough, I can click on lakes now. And um, like I said, I'm being kind to Wisconsin, giving them a little bit of a head start here. 
Um, okay, so um, that's great. We know it works. Let's let's try out the lake counting. Um, so, or, or let's uh, take this this test callback function away. So now, uh, and the key thing here is I, I used remove equals true. And now, and if I try clicking on the uh, map, nothing happens. Okay, so um, I've one of the other things in those details up above was a um, function that that takes into account the position of the mouse. Um, if you see any problems with this as I'm going along, feel free to speak up. So I'm going to start clicking on some Minnesota lakes, which are apparently scenic. They're round. They're beautiful. Uh, let's click on some Wisconsin lakes. Um, nobody notices anything odd here. Yeah, so uh, right, obviously I, I, the only thing that Wisconsin gets is uh, side eye eye rolls or uh, some shade. Um, and um, if I jump back up here real quick, the um, what I did here was check the um, mouse position. If it was far enough to the left, it counted as Minnesota Lake, and if I was I was far enough to the right, it was a Wisconsin Lake. Um, so just a couple other things. Um, the actual motivation for this was not counting lakes. It was looking at astronomical images and being able to zoom in and out on them and get cursor positions out of them. And that is it. Today, I not only released um, version 2.0, but I got to release version 2.01 because 2.0 didn't install. Um, and I've got 20 seconds left, it looks like. So quick shout out for one of my favorite lightning talks, which is about waffles from 2014. Woo, waffles. There should be, you know, since you're doing this Minnesota representation, I think you should maybe do a LEFSA presentation next time, you know? So it does, t it turns out I didn't grow up in Minnesota. Wow. So I've, wow. Never actually, I've never actually made LEFSA. Okay. You're just surrounded by it. I was uh, born was in a, LEFSA. There was a reader it. talk. Yes. Yes, surrounded <laughs> by LEFSA. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. That was great. Uh, and uh, thank you for um, resurrecting the conversation from this morning about counting lakes. If anybody really needs to know the data, um, you can you can Google it. And uh, Minnesota wins basically all the time. Sorry, Wisconsin. But Wisconsin wins with cheese. So um, and Wisconsin's in our next poll. So or the one after this one. So get ready. Do we have our next poll? I am. <laughs> this is a question that we need to ask ourselves every year, mm. just for confirmation. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's an important question we need to ask ourselves all the time and never forget. Who is next? John is next, and then I pulled Marthu up, and then, yeah. OK, John. I'm trying to share, but maybe the movies were a mistake. So I will just start talking. I'm John Geyer. I'm a computational material scientist at NIST. And I spend a lot of my time um, modeling the evolution of different microstructures, often in metals. Um, and I don't usually mean hydrogen or helium. Um, <laughs> uh, let me see if I can get anything to go. The movies are certainly not going to cooperate. This is really going to be disappointing. Um, let me skip those. All right, this is really embarrassing. So um, much of what I do in the simulations I write, um, for instance, in the sci-fi library, um, 
wow, this is no good. I cannot present while a question is shown on stage. Uh, is there a question on stage right now for other people? I don't I don't think so, but that's what it says to me when I scroll over the present button. Let me try again. Technology is awesome. There you go. All right, there we go. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, what I spent a lot of my time doing is doing something for some number of steps uh, or doing something for some amount of time or simulate something for 600 time units and generate 100 nucleation times uh over the interval of zero to 600 and then output the results at six times ten to the minus four and six times ten to the minus two and six and six hundred units oh and run an optimized uh, adaptive time stepper based on the error of the solutions and suddenly those four loops uh start to get really complicated and i spend feels like i spend more of my time writing those four loops at the end of the code than i do actually writing the full uh, computational model of what I'm trying to simulate. Now, I know there are solutions out there for uh, doing things like this, things like ODEN, ODE, Solve IDP. I've found a whole bunch of different interfaces to sundials. I don't understand any of them, but I know in principle that if I could wrap my head around them, they would solve my problem. Um, part of where I run into trouble with these is they all talk about ODEs, and I'm not thinking about ODEs, even though I know perfectly well when I solve PDEs on a computer, I'm really solving ODEs. I don't think of it that way. Um, and then the other thing is they're all callback oriented. And so it feels to me when I write code like this, this is one of the examples from ODEN, that I've turned my code inside out. I had a nice simple for loop, I understood the logic of what I was doing, and now I've wrapped that all up inside a routine and I have to pass my arguments and, it, it just muddies the waters and makes it very confusing, especially if I want to start monitoring what's going on inside this loop or doing things at different nesting levels, say those different nucleation steps, different checkpoint steps, and so on. So my solution to that was to develop the package that I call Stepping Stones. Uh, stepping Stones uh, is a Middle English word referring to stones used in steps of a stairway or uh, steps in a stream before crossing. Uh, and references to this word go back at least to 1474. Uh, but it's also uh, in a Pythonic uh, realm, it's a, a set of iterators for advancing from some starting look position to some stopping condition, um, following either user defined value or error uh, to drive the solution. And so in stepping stones, that last uh, example of stepping in time, would uh, be uh, accomplished by importing a fixed stepper, saying that you want to start at some time zero, run for some total time, take steps of dt, do something with that step size, and then each loop uh, tell the stepper that you have succeeded. For something a little bit richer, um, I can have a variety of other steppers, and so. I might set an initial condition, run a stepper, um, do something with the step um, time and size, calculate some error metric based on that uh, do something else routine. And I do happy things, otherwise I do sad things and I go ask the stepper to give me another attempt, step attempt, uh, generally a smaller one than it just offered me. Um, if I have some set of known checkpoints where I know I want results, then I can use a checkpoint stepper. I can specify the times that I want to do steps. And then I can run some other stepper for each of those checkpoint steps um, that will evolve by whatever metric it wants to use. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And so this inner loop is the same as the loop we just showed, but now we can pointedly save results at widely disparate points that are, that are meaningful. Um, yeah, yeah. And so um, here we've got some examples of some of the other steppers. This is a fixed stepper. Uh, not very interesting. Um, oh, we can no. do 
a sequence stepper. John, it's getting so like close. Am I out of time? So a variety of different steppers that can allocate points either in a sequential or in a uh, non-monotonic way. Um, and oh, then no, no, I'm not even going to try to explain that. You're definitely over time. I'm over time. Well, then you need to pull, get the hook, get the hook. We're ready. So I'm not even going to try to explain that hook. last one. That's that's where you go. There's John has been pulled. He's been pulled from the stage. Oh, oh. wow! <laughs> Pull section. It, it's it's it was great talk though. I'm thinking about using stepping stones to model how many steps it takes me to exit Vim. So. Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, you could probably toss your laptop in one of those lakes in Minnesota, right? <laughs> like another... No, that's what the Wisconsin ones are for. Oh, <laughs> oh laptop lakes. Yeah, it's well, like since a we're at, Since we're talking about polling, I was just like fishing for some compliments <laughs> now. So, <laughs> well. and this uh, poll also has um, puns in it, so you really get puns all the way down. I really wish that I could vote in this one. What would you vote for? All cheese all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's a clear leader right now. <clears throat> yeah. Well, we did give Wisconsin representation here because I feel like Wisconsin deserves it. Like, yeah. It's a good one. Seth, uh, you can, I think since you're up, you should be getting your um, presentation ready and turning on your camera. This is a pretty Gouda poll. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's all Gouda, <laughs> all the time. Yeah, I see, so Myrtle, I see you unmuted yourself. Yeah. Oh, I, I can't share my screen yet. Oh. It, it says it? Only, only one person can share your screen at a given time. Yeah, can, can, you, can, you, John? can you unshare John? I'm gonna boot John from the stage. Okay. <laughs> 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 we did the kill dash nine. You should All be able right. to do that. Now. Yeah, let, let me figure this out. Uh, All right, Windows. Nope. Did, did you see the presentation now? Uh, we see click to exit full screen. Oh, uh, wait. Was it, it is visible now, but yeah, it's, it's not in this present part, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah anyway, that, that, that doesn't matter. Anyway, so, so let, let's start this. And uh, like before I start, I, I would just want to say that I'm so excited to see so many cool Jupyter projects. And like, I feel like we should have more of these lightning talks. And uh, we'd probably see much more. Uh, of these projects. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm Mridul Seid. For my day job, I do Jupiter things at Cases Germany. It's a it's a research institute for social sciences in Germany. And in this talk, I want to give you a peek to uh, peek into persistent binder hub. Um, I call it the best of both worlds. So, so people who did their tutorials would have already seen something called my binder, the magical magical unicorn. So. Like if you ever ever you know, ran into Jupyter notebooks on GitHub, you would have always seen this button called Launch with Binder. So this is that magic button that uh, spins up a reproducible, stable environment uh, for you in a for, in a server far, far, far away, and uh, you don't need to worry about any any of the any of the setups. Like you don't need to install anything. You don't have to do pip. You don't have to do conda. Like life is easy. No more fights. So that's the that's the magical binder part, but uh, the, the issue with that is like uh, the way binder was de designed is it's uh, these are ephemeral uh, eph ephemeral sessions that as soon as you close your tab, your work is gone, which is great for for like short tutorials or like you know, short talks. But uh, at Gazes, uh, we wanted to have a persistent binder in the sense that. If I do my work today, like um, I'm running in an environment, I want to come back tomorrow and do this thing, uh, do this thing again. So, and Jupyter Hub already provides you this. Like Jupyter Hub uh, can take care of the storage or the authentication of user management. So, what Persistent Binder Hub does is it's 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 like a it's some sort of a glue between a Binder Hub and Jupyter Hub. Like you now we take the best of both worlds, the the magic button 
and uh, and you have your own user storage and with that you end up with persistent binder hub it's uh, it's available as a helm chart uh, if you want to deploy it locally uh, it's so we also have like a, a public de deployment available at notebooks.gazes.org and uh, and like uh, like the way it works is that it takes your git uh, repo or like a zenodo archive or a fixture uh, archive and it creates a docker container for, out of that and uh, like it just spins up a nice container somewhere in in some server and you just log into that and life is easy you don't need to install anything and and this especially, this especially works for people who are not uh like, like, like not even computer scientists i would say like people who don't like fiddling around with their environments so it's like no, social scientists are not known for that so it, it's it's a great tool for that if if you just want to concentrate on tutorials rather than setting up environments and like and like like, like if you haven't uh, checked my binder yet please go ahead do that it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing and if you want persistent you could also check out uh, persistent binder up uh, uh, some, someone posted a, a link for, of, for that in the chat so yep i, I guess th that's me and if you want to talk about this i'm here around tomorrow and for the sprints too probably and i'm on github at little less and if you are interested if you have new use cases if you have any ideas how we can improve this please open an issue or uh, uh, like send in a peer thanks thank you yeah thanks very much. yes David, I'm still thinking about you all cheese all the time because I haven't seen a queso fountain behind you yet. <laughs> I know, I'm, it's it's in the mail. Is it yeah, in the tomorrow, mail? Okay. There's gonna be a dramatic reveal. I'm gonna... Are you? I hope you have like I hope you have a blanket that you're gonna pull off, but instead of a blanket, it's just queso. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna yank a sheet off, and there's just gonna be a a flowing queso fountain. Yeah. Yeah, see, I think you'll have the elaborate setup and I'll have like um, my not elaborate setup, which will just be a kiddie pool with a like tea candle under <laughs> it. <laughs> Wait, that's not elaborate? Because that's what I was planning on doing. I don't. Oh, How okay. <laughs> yeah, well, oops. Sorry, I accidentally <laughs> insulted your queso setup. Speaking of queso fountains, if you haven't ordered a queso fountain and you'd like to just um, enjoy one, you can find one in Gathertown, which is the next space that we will be all heading over towards for the boffs and for the networking sessions. And don't forget that we always have posters. Uh, we have all of our posters up. Um, I'm yes, and many poster presenters will be at their posters and have interactive things with their posters. So. I strongly encourage you to, we all strongly encourage you to go by the posters and try to talk to the people while they're there. We have a nice setup. Um, but also you should watch and check out and interact with the queso fountain. There's so many Easter eggs. Please go check out the queso fountain. Yeah. I'm dropping links in this to get to gather town spaces for the boss for everyone. Slowly, painfully. Slowly. Perfect. Thank you. I'm using that link right now. I'm going to go hang out Excellent. in the queso fountain. Yes, do it. <laughs> if, if I've heard a rumor that if you get deep enough into the queso fountain, you'll fall in. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like a queso yeah. portal. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Mm, I, don't know. I see. When it's like a I persistently hole. stay there, like a persistent. Uh, a persistent you know, case of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Let's do it. Yes. Let's rotel out of here. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> All right. See, see everybody tomorrow. Bye. Bye.